Uh, another thing that ER nurses go through that I don't think most nurses go through, I think psych nurses do, but we have to go through a program called CPI and it is literally a self-defense program. And okay. so I remember, yeah, I remember as a new grad going to this program, it was held in like a big area, almost like a gym. And they are actually teaching me how to defend myself if a patient grabs my ponytail or if they grab me by my neck or if they, they try, to, try to bite me. Like, and I remember having this real talk moment with myself, like, what am I doing right now? Like, they are teaching me how to get out of a chokehold <laughs> because of the place that I'm going to work. Is this crazy? Is this real life? That is a scary um, thing to, yes, yes. Yeah, and it's the reality of the emergency room. Uh, so we definitely have to keep our head on a swivel. Better to have a short life that is full of what you like doing than a long life spent in a miserable way. Hey. Welcome back, you guys. Thank you very much for joining me. My name is Swadik Mayanja, but you guys can call me Q, and we are on another episode of the Everyday Hero Show, where I bring to you someone in your life or someone in my life that brings us joy, happiness, good things, good things all around, but does not get the credit that they deserve. Ladies and gentlemen, if you did not know, I don't know what you've been doing. I'm kidding. Because I didn't know. I, I found out super late. It is E-D-E-R Nurses Week. It's special. I don't know why. Uh, well, thank you so much. I, I don't know why um, ED nurses get their own special week, but we'll find out because I got many, many questions for our guests this week. Um, we have Nisa from the uh, Q, wait, the Q Word podcast. The um, Q Word podcast. The yeah. Q Word podcast. She's the host of uh, the Q Word podcast. She is an ED, ER nurse, whatever you want to call it. Um, it is ED nurses week. It's a special week. So let's just jump on in. Uh, Nisa, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you very much for joining me. Thanks for having me. I love being with uh, Q the Nurse uh, for the Q Word Podcast connection. There, it's that's right. Great. That's right. The Q is a, it's a, it's a good letter. It's a good it letter. Good letter. Uh, yeah, it depends on what the word is, but it's a good letter. <clears throat> so, uh, Nisa, uh, just uh, origin story. I want you to give me the real origin story. Who are you? Where are you from? And why nursing? All right. Um, so I'm Nisa Hadaway. I am. A ner emergency nurse is my background. I fly full time, um, but still stay PRN in my local emergency department where I have my whole foundation of my nursing career. I love that place. Um, and I hope I never leave there. Nursing is a second career for me. I have a degree in something else from a previous life. Um, but um, one of so my family was involved in a very serious car accident and one of my children, he was just seven months old at the time, he was very seriously injured. And uh, so we ended up in the pediatric intensive care unit for over a week, probably about nine or 10 days or so. And then he had a lot of follow up. He ended up back in the PICU a year later for a scheduled surgery that was pretty major. And just going through that whole experience and seeing how the healthcare team cared for him and cared for us as a family. And then also kind of how his little body miraculously healed itself with their, with their guidance and assistance. I just wanted to be a part of that. So, um, once the littles were big enough to go to school, then I went back to nursing school. Wowzers, just wowzers. Uh, so first and foremost, I, I that's that's deep. Okay, so that's a huge reason to switch a career. Was nursing ever a thought before this accident happened? Before this happened, was nursing ever an idea, a thought, a, a, a profession you were thinking about? Or is this totally out of left field? After it happened, you're like, I've got to do this. It was like a lightning strike. If you had told me in high school I was going to be a nurse, I would have said, absolutely not, no way. Not a chance. <laughs> um, so it was a, it was a 180. Well, good for you. Um, well, well, I'm happy that you've joined the nursing profession. I do believe that nursing is the greatest profession in the history of the world. Um, and, and, and it's, it's a good thing that you are in the ED, but you just said that right in the beginning, you said that you are, you do flight. Explain what that is versus just regular emergency room ED um, nursing. Right. So um, flight nursing is basically what's happening in the ER. Only we do it in a little shaky tin can in the sky. Um, so we do two different types of flights. We go directly to the scene where EMS has called us off into a very rural area where the patient needs more resources than they can get in a hurry. Uh, and then the other one is where we go to a, a local facility, maybe a small hospital, a community hospital, 
they have a patient that needs more resources than they have at their facility, and they're asking us to take them to a large trauma center or to a comprehensive stroke center or a pediatric hospital, a burn hospital. Uh, those are some of the kind of patients and, and calls that we do. Okay. So it's, it's, it's emergency nursing. It's just uh, 10 steps outside of the hospital. <laughs> Which is super, super intense. And I want to get back up there, right? But let's rewind, right? Because nursing as a second career. Um, I think this is, I, I, I love nursing because there's a lot of different entrances into how you can join the nursing profession. Um, and it's one of those professions, once you do get in, there's a million different places you can go with nursing, right? So <clears throat> I want you to back up. As someone who joined nursing as a second career, a second degree, was it difficult getting over that hump? And then once you became a nurse, why did you decide the ED? Right. Uh, so going back to school was interesting all of a sudden where I was a B solid BC student in high school and my first time around in college, uh, I was, I wanted A's and you know, A's in nursing school, that's, whew, that's tough. It's hard to come and, by. Yeah, it's hard to come by. And I had uh, a family at home, little kids, and I was spending every minute with my nose in a book and it was a very different college experience than I had the first time around. Nursing school is no joke. It is so hard uh, for good reason. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, uh, the stakes are also very high when you're caring for patients. So you got to know your stuff. But um, I definitely, if you took, if you took all the years of studying I did in the four years for my previous bachelor's, it wouldn't have matched probably one semester of nursing <laughs> or anatomy and physiology. So it was, it was definitely a very different experience. Um, ER nursing, I did not pick it. It picked me. I picked labor and delivery. Um, the, I went to nursing school to be an L&D nurse. The whole time I was in nursing school, I was sure that I was going to be an L&D nurse. Uh, I, I just sort of serendipitously um, got assigned to the ER, my senior practicum. And I went down there and thought, what is happening down here in this place? This is wow, this is crazy and amazing and ridiculous. And I love every bit of it. And I hired on as a new grad to the ER and I've never worked a day of labor and delivery in my life. And um, it picked me. Have you worked in any other unit floor type of nursing or has it been ED the entire time? So I would do all of my overtime. So one shift a week in the ICUs, the adult ICUs. So med surge, surgical trauma, and um, neuro. And then I did a contract, an agency contract in a burn ICU, all the while working full time in my ER. And then um, I have also done a clinical instructor for a nursing school, and they were assigned to a renal med surge floor. Um, and so I worked with them as a clinical instructor on a med surge floor, but I've, I've never done a day of med surge. I've never done L and D. Uh, I have done some ICU, but my full thrust has been ER. Okay. So, um, uh, Nisa, I have to say you are, I, I, I don't want to jump the gun here, but it sounds like you're a workaholic. I mean, this is crazy. <laughs> How were you working full time in an ER and working as a clinical instructor, working in the ICU, working at the bird? How in the, and now you have a podcast for, this is insane. All right. So, <laughs> so let's take this one step at a time. Cause this is, this, this is a lot. All right. So, uh, the thing that I always worry about, because you're right, the very, I, I haven't, I, I never had a practicum. I never had a clinical rotation. I never even, um, like, uh, what's it called? Uh, shadowed a nurse in the ER. The only time I've ever been in the ER is when I got my job at a, a cardiac floor and part of our orientation on the cardiac floor, they want to send you one day um, to just shadow a nurse in the ER, one day shadow a nurse in the ICU. So I got to do that. And you were right slap in the face. It is absolutely nuts, crazy, mind-blowing going downstairs in the ER and seeing how these nurses handle everything that just gets thrown at them 24-7. So how, 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 Nisa, as a new grad, did you go from, I don't know how to put an IV in, I don't know what meds to give, I don't even know what pill this is, to working in the ER, the most hectic, craziest place I've ever seen. Tell me that process, because that sounds like a huge leap of faith. 
It is a huge leap. It is throwing you into the deep end of the pool for sure. It's probably a good thing that new grads don't know what they don't know when they start there. Uh, it's probably a good thing that new grads don't understand how sick some of these patients are or could be very quickly. Um, so it, it is a trick and it's not for everybody and it's not for every new grad. Um, you know, I, I had some, I had very good preceptors. I had a great educator who, um, and mentors, charge nurses who were used to, you know, welcomed new grad nurses and were used to teaching us and, and easing us into it. I will say when you go down to the ER as a new grad, um, and even probably a transfer from another area, you're not going to be the trauma nurse for the first year. They're not going to put you as the triage nurse for the first year. Um, you will be in the med surge area. You'll be caring for anywhere from three to five patients, uh, kind of getting your, your foundation and your feet under you. And then once they realize that you've got a good foundation, you understand what sick is, you can recognize it pretty quickly. Then you start rotating to the critical care area. Then you start holding the trauma phone. Then you start going out to triage. So it is a stepwise process, but, um, it's, uh, it's a tough place for new grads. It's, it's a great place, but it's tough. The thing is, it sounds to me like you really enjoyed, like, so when you were, got hired at your job, did you check the box, I want to work in the ER, like that's a possibility, or was that the first job offer, and like every new grad nurse, you jump at the opportunity? How, like, did you choose it, or did it literally just be the only option they gave you? So we had this super, super cool program that was called a critical care nurse residency. So this is for people who can't exactly decide what they want to be when they grow up. Mm. So I interviewed for the critical care nurse residency and I interviewed for L and D because that was, you know, yep. so, uh, I, I did take the residency and what that meant was I got to spend a month in every one of the adult ICUs and then a month in the ER. And then at the end, so at the beginning, it means that every one of those directors had to say, yeah, I would hire you. And then at the end, it means that you pick then which one you fit into best. And so as I rotated from neuro to med surge to CV to trauma and then down to the ER, I loved them all. I wanted to know it all, do it all, see it all. And, um, but that's not how real life works. So you had to, you have to make a decision. Of course. <clears throat> ER was the place where I could see um, pediatrics. I could see geriatrics. I could see hearts. I could see brains. I could see psych a little bit of all of that. Um, and so that's where I ended up landing, but that's also how I, I got that rotation where I could work in the ICUs um, as my overtime because I had done that residency. So that's why I kept on, I just, I said, I just want to keep rotating forever. But the way that I did it was I stayed in the uh, ER and then did my overtimes in the ICU. And honestly, I went to the ICUs because it made me a better ER nurse. Uh, having those drips, having those vents, um, getting a little bit more exposure and a little bit more depth than you would in the ER. It made me a better ER nurse. So, yeah, of course, right? Um, so I'm just going to jump right back in. And what I was saying is I really like the way you described that because I have that itch where I want to try many, many different things, right? Um, but I want to get your honest opinion. Um, you seem like you were like you were an adult when you joined, when you became a nurse, right? When you switched your career to become a nurse. Um, would you advise new grads? Would you advise new nurses to jump in the deep end and go straight to the ED? Because I do have that itch, but I'm also really afraid because I, I do get nervous and it is a shell shock and it is very, very, very different than working on the floor. And we'll get to the, the differences between the ICU and the e, e, ER in a bit, but would you advise new nurses, new grads um, to start out in the EDER or do you think that they should start out on a med surge floor? Yeah, that's a great question. I freaking love that question. Um, so here's what, here's why I love that is I love the ER. It's a huge passion of mine. And so I thought that everyone else would have that same feeling about it. So when I was the educator in the department, I recruited hard. I would go down to the cafeteria. I would see a table full of student nurses and I would go over to them and be like, who wants to go to the ER? Who doesn't know what they want to be when they grow up? Let me sell it to you. It's so great. And I would tell them all the wonderful things about about it. Leave out some of the downsides, you know, of course. and, um, and, and I, any chance I had in front of a student or a nurse, if I could snatch someone from the heart tower or steal someone from ICU and recruit them away, I would do it. And there was a nurse who, uh, a, a young lady who I knew I have known her her whole life since she was a little girl, super smart, 
hilarious, has the same kind of humor and um, per really similar personality to me, love her. And I was like, you have to be an ER nurse. You've got to come and be one of us. And she was ready, hook, line, and sinker. She was sold. And she got into the ER and she absolutely hated it. And I couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe that it wouldn't click for everyone, but it doesn't. Uh, it clicks for a lot of people. It's a good place for a lot of people, but it is not for everyone. And we would hire about eight new grads at a time, and one or two of them would end up someplace else. By the end of orientation, they would find that it just wasn't what they thought it was. Uh, the other six, it would be home. You know, it, it would click. Um, I will also say that while it is a, a, a a deep learning curve for, for new grads. It can be done with the right preceptors, the right educators, the right system in place. Uh, when we have nurses who have a med surge foundation or an ICU foundation and they decide they want to put a toe into the ER and see what it's like, they do very well oftentimes, very, very well, because they have time management down, they've got assessment skills down, um, and, and they can then adapt to the chaos. Uh, so oftentimes when they come with a few years of med search experience, they do very, very well transitioning. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Now, and, and You should come down. You should totally come. <laughs> oh, Nisa, come you, better, you better believe I'll be there. Just give me a couple more months, maybe years, but I'll be there. I'll be <laughs> come there. on now. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, and, and that's good. Okay. So look, so it's out there y'all, right? So she told you what you need to do or what to expect. Right. But let, let, let me talk about the shit that you don't, I know you like to recruit people and you like to tell people this is the good part about the ED, the ER, but let's talk about the stuff that isn't so good. Right. So we know you're in love with it. We know that it called your name and you were a perfect fit for it, but give me a couple of things that frustrate you about the ER. Give me a couple of reasons why it, it, sometimes it's like, you know what? I don't want to go to work today. Tell me about the frustrations when working in the ER. Yeah, this is also a great question. Uh, so let's real talk it for a minute. So my friend, Kevin McFarland, who is also an ER nurse, he says, and he puts it perfectly. He says the ER is the only department that can't say no. Yes. Um, and that's, you know, we don't turn patients away. So we only have so many beds. We only have so many hall stretchers, so many chairs in the waiting room. Um, but we don't turn people away. Um, I don't know if you guys have Krispy Kreme in, in Boston, but uh, sometimes when Krispy Kreme is cooking the donuts fresh, they turn the hot donuts now sign on yes. and everyone comes and flocks to get the hot donuts now. <laughs> sometimes we will say that in triage. Did someone turn the freaking hot donuts now? <laughs> Everyone is here. Why did everyone come all of a sudden in the last hour? Everybody in town showed up to the ER. So that's a frustration. It's very, very frustrating when you have super sick people in the waiting room and no place to put them. And the care has to be postponed a little bit uh, until we can make room for them. It's very frustrating when people use the ER as their primary care. It's very frustrating when people use it as an urgent care. So they come in for something that is not exactly an emergency. Those are our people. In real reality, we have to care for those urgent care and primary care people. Um, that's a reality of the ER. It's not what we're supposed to be set up for, but it is what we do. And it's a lot of what we do. Uh, not every single patient that we see is on death's door or having a true emergency. It's more of a perceived emergency. They think it's an emergency. Uh, and so we treat them as such. Uh, psych is a very frustrating part of the ER. Um, in well, my wait, wait, Nisa, Nisa. Uh, okay, so I, I am going to allow you to finish answering that question, but I really want to slow down right there. Have yeah. you worked as a triage nurse? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, okay, so let's, let's talk about this for a hot second, okay? Because... When you work on the floor and these uh, ER nurses send you patients that you're like, this is a walkie talkie, please, can, can you not? Right. So explain to us, right, us regular nurses in the world at large, what is the process when someone comes in and you can look in their eyes and you know they're bullshitting you? I mean, you're a nurse, you know these things, right? So when someone comes in and they're bullshitting you and you see someone that's like in a lot of pain, explain in like a, like a seventh grade, eighth grade level how you go about as a triage nurse working through all these patients so patients understand that you're not just disowning people or ignoring people and us nurses understand how you go about picking who you pick. 
Yeah, and this is super key to good ER nursing is what's happening in triage. So the triage nurse has to be able to take a look at what those complaints are that, you know, you got five people who just signed in. Uh, who are you going to be most worried about uh, of these five people? And you're going to put an eye on them out in the waiting room and see is someone gray, is someone weak, is someone fine, uh, someone eating Cheetos, uh, what, <laughs> what's happening out there. And uh, what the general public doesn't understand is that it's not like a restaurant. It's not like you walk into a restaurant and they hand you your little, your little uh, shaky thingy and when your table's ready, you get to go and it's after the person that was in front of you, but before the person behind you. That's not how triage works. We take the sickest. And so you may be waiting two, three hours for a bed and the person who walks in the door is half dead. They're getting the bed ahead of you. Um, and it's very, very hard for the general public to understand that and accept that. It's also hard when you say, well, that you can't just say to someone, this patient is sicker because that makes them feel like you are um, not acknowledging their illness or their mother's illness or their child's illness. Uh, so it's very, very tricky in triage to, um, to keep the masses at bay. And oftentimes what happens is when you get someone who is disgruntled or very frustrated and they start getting loud, it almost becomes contagious. And then other people start getting frustrated and other people start getting loud. And man, it is a triage nurse's superpower to be able to go out there and just kind of like calm them and promise everyone that you're doing the best that you can. <laughs> and it's super frustrating for us when we know that every bed in the hospital is full. We're working off of discharges. Every bed in the ER is full. A lot of them are admission holds. And I've got this little 87 year old with chest pain out here who's really, really sick and needs a bed but I don't have, no one has one for them. Um, so triage can be a really, really tough place. And uh, that's why we don't put new grads there for a while. Yes. It's, a, it's definitely a skill that you get, um, that you have to fine tune. The other thing about triage that's really interesting is you have patients that will come in. So imagine a little old lady comes in and sits down in your triage room and you say, hey, uh, can you tell me why you're at the hospital today? And she says, baby, I'm just so sick. And that's oh, all you get. And so now I have to figure out, is she just a little lonely old lady who needs someone to talk? Or is she having a stroke? Is this a psych patient? Is this a heart attack? What is happening? Is this, you know, I have to put, know what questions to ask her quickly to suss out whether this is really true and truly an emergency or whether, you know, she's just a little lonely old lady. Um, so sometimes they don't walk in and tell you exactly what's going on. Um, uh, you have to like know how to, them, yes. how to look for it, right? Of and do course. some quick vital signs, quick questions, quick medical history, and then go, crap, this little lady is really sick. Or, you know, I think she's all right. So how often can a triage nurse just let a patient know that you don't need to be admitted? Like, how often is a triage nurse like shooing the non pa like the patients that don't necessarily need to be there, the primary care patients, the urgent care patients, or just the, the, the old ladies, or just the people in general that are just there to be there. How, like what, I don't even want you to put a number on it, but like how often are you doing that and just being like, you don't need to be here. I'll catch you later. Bye-bye. Yeah, I can tell you a number. It's zero. It's illegal for us. It's illegal for stop, us to do that. To stop it's it. called stop Intala. It. We have to medically screen every single person who walks in the door and says, I need to be seen. Oh Zero. God. That's what, that's what my friend Kevin means when he says we cannot say no, it is illegal. We have to medically screen them and not a nurse. It has to be a provider, an oh NP or God. an MP. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is, this is part of the frustration of the ER is those folks. And those are the ones who are going to wait five, six, seven hours on a really bad day because we're going to be taking the true emergencies ahead of them. We can't tell them, you know, you really should have gone to your physician's office or you just need to be at home in your bed eating chicken noodle soup. This is just, <laughs> you know, we can't do that. We have so, to see them. All. Yeah. So in, like when you work up on the floor, you notice that there is a revolving door of some patients that come in and come out, come in and come out. Um, and, and I know, it literally, I, what state are you in? What state do you, are, are you working from? Like, I'm in base. Georgia. You're in Georgia. All right. So I know that there's a revolving door of patients that come in and out, especially on like the specific units, right? And you get to get to know these patients. But as a triage nurse, as an ER nurse, you must see these patients much more often than we do. Number one. And number two, I know that there's this homeless issue that's across the nation and especially in the bigger cities. Do you see these homeless folks? Do you see these rotating patients 
as often as we do more often. And like, how do you tell these people you cannot come back if you're yes. even allowed to say that? Yeah, so we don't tell them that. We, we maybe wish that sometimes, but we don't tell them that. We definitely see the homeless people. We definitely see what we call the frequent flyers. Um, and, and the trick with that is the patients who are coming in frequently who have a lot of comorbidities or have some psych issues or have uh, limited resources, they don't have a home, uh, or a steady home that they can go to. We do see them frequently. And so a lot of times you want to just kind of blow it off and just be like, yeah, we're just going to medically screen you out as quickly as we can. But these people also sometimes have really true illnesses. And so you have to suss through that. Is this that day that this person really is having a heart attack or really does have an infection? Or is this just another day that they needed a roof over their heads? What are uh, a lot of times the people who don't have a safe home or a steady home to go to, they will come in. They, they know the system as well as you or I. They will come in and say they're having chest pain <laughs> because they know that that means we have to do a troponin and then in three hours, another one, and then oftentimes in three hours, another. So that buys them six hours or, or more in a, in a warm bed. And um, they can take a rest and be in air conditioning or be, you know, in the winter, they can be in the heat, they can be out of the elements. Uh, they also will say, you know, that they're suicidal um, because they know that's going to buy them. We take that very, very seriously. We have to, even of if we course. think it's just attention seeking behavior or just someone who needs, uh, uh, you know, the air conditioning and three meals. Um, so they know that's going to buy them several days in, um, in the hospital. So they, they know the system just as much as we do, but our homeless population also can truly be suicidal. So it's, um, it's very sticky. That's a rough, rough, like, I don't know. It's so easy when you work on the floors to just throw the blame on the ER. So I'm just going to say that, right? Like right off the bat, it's super, super, super easy to just be like, oh, God damn it. These ER nurses, number one, they just throw everybody up on the floors. And number two, they do no documentation, which we will get back to. <laughs> <laughs> which we will get back to in a hot second. Right. Yeah. But um, before I, I did cut you off and you just mentioned the suicide and that's a huge key, right? That's humongous, humongous. And uh, I like the fact that more people are talking about mental illness, but I don't see the money coming in for mental illness, but I do see the conversation happening a lot more often, which makes me very happy. Right. But I want to talk about mental illness from a different perspective, from the nurse's perspective, right? A lot. Um, I don't know if you know of silence, uh, silent, no more. Have you heard of silent? No more. Yes. Yeah, so, and when you look at the statistics for nurses that get physically abused, um, verbally abused, any kind of work workplace violence, it is insane. When you compare the numbers of, if you're a regular nurse, like if you're working on the floor, it happens this percentage of the time. But when you look at ER nurses, it is sky high, sky high. So just I want to talk about that situation because it's so scary. Like I am afraid to go into an elderly patient's room that is, that has, you, you know, dementia or something that is confused and they're swinging. And this is, I'm talking about like an 80, 90 year old person, but in the ER, you guys are dealing with the alcoholics. You guys are dealing with the violence of literally people coming in with stab wounds, gunshot wounds. You're dealing with every bot, like everybody. Right. And then you also have to think about the mental illness and then the physical and the verbal abuse. So I'm just going to open the floor and I want you to take this to wherever you want to take it. But how are you guys in the ER dealing with trying to protect yourself and at the same time, trying to help these patients that can be violent physically or verbally? Yeah. Wow. That's a really, really good uh, lead up. So, um, in, in my particular emergency room, we're super lucky because we have sworn out um, sheriffs in our, like real sheriffs. They are not rent-a-cops, they are not security guards. They have real guns with real bullets. And we have two of them in our department all the time. We have eight of them in the hospital. And of those eight, two are in our department all the time. Our department is huge. And so they can't be everywhere all the time, but they are constantly rounding. Um, we are not supposed to approach the psych patients without them. Uh, they do wand our patients when they initially come in. So uh, that's, that's a measure there. Um, there are a lot of things that you can do to kind of keep a heads up, keep your head on the swivel, always be suspicious. 
but it is very frustrating when some of the, the nursing organizations say we have a zero tolerance policy. We are not going to accept any violence against any nurse. And I, I love and appreciate the, the idea behind that. The reality behind that is just like you said, you've got a sweet little 80 year old dementia patient who doesn't mean anything by it, but snatches you up and claws you. Of course. Um, there's no way to ever prevent that kind of thing. Uh, another thing that ER nurses go through that I don't think most nurses go through, I think psych nurses do, but we have to go through a program called CPI and it is literally a self-defense program. And oh, so wow. I remember, yeah, I remember as a new grad going to this program, it was held in like a big area, almost like a gym. And they are actually teaching me how to defend myself if a patient grabs my ponytail or if they grab me by my neck or if they, they try to try to bite me. like. And I remember having this real talk moment with myself, like, what am I doing right now? Like, they are teaching me how to get out of a <laughs> chokehold because of the place that I'm going to work. Is this crazy? Is this real life? That is a scary thing to, yes, yes. Yeah, and it's the reality of the emergency room. Uh, so we definitely have to keep our head on a swivel. We definitely see people in their acute phases where we are trying to get them stabilized so that we can then send them to you. That doesn't guarantee that they're going to be nice to you either. But, um, but we do see them in the, in the acute phases. The other thing that you mentioned is we do see a lot of violence. Yes. And um, so we see the gunshot wounds and the stab wounds. We see the domestic violence. And then sometimes when the job is not finished, someone wants to come and try to finish the job. And so you have to be very, very careful in those situations too. And, um, uh, you know, we had a we had a mass casualty one time in my department where one of the 15 passenger vans full of prisoners that was going to do like a, a work detail, they wrecked on the interstate. And so they brought 15 pa uh, uh, prisoners into our department as patients. And so you've got flight risks and you've got patients who are all no press, no info, and you've got shackles and you've got backboards and it's just pandemonium. And we love it. <laughs> we love it. <laughs> Uh, but it, it is a really, in fact, I haven't even, my co-host and I recorded an episode on violence in the ER and we tabled it because I didn't even feel like we could do justice to it. Like, I don't know the answer. I don't know what to say. I don't think there's ever going to be a time when we have zero violence against any nurse, but especially ER nurses who are kind of the front line where the patients are acutely psychotic or acutely in pain or acutely intoxicated. Um, and so we, we just kind of sat it there because it just didn't feel like it was giving the respect or the um, gravity or the answers that we're all looking for. So, uh, yeah, it's, it is definitely something that happens down there. And, and that's one thing I just I know it's e, uh, ER Nurses Week. And that's one thing I have to just clap it up for all ER nurses, because you guys really take that first punch in the face. Like you guys have to first decide. I mean, if the patient is violent, if. It, right. Or if the family member is violent or whatever, you guys are the initial like, all right, you know, pause, let's see what happens. And then you send them up to a psych floor or whatever floor they need to go to. But that's one thing you have to like, as all nurses, we have to just be like, you know, ER, you guys get that. You guys, you guys have that. That's on you. You, you guys are the superheroes in that um, forte. Let's talk about the things that I can't give it up to ER nurses. Okay. So let's see. Can, can we oh, talk? Yeah. You're going to talk about this. Oh, yeah. Let's so, do it. Let's can, hear it. Can we please talk about this documentation? Yes. I get that there's a million things going on, but Nisa, Nisa, yeah. I get patients. We don't even know their code status. We don't even have a last name for them. We don't know. I mean, you said you get a med history. We don't know any medications that come through. We know nothing about this patient besides they need to be on the cardiac floor. And I'm like, how do you even know that if you don't know? Like, so, okay. So explain to me, how does it happen that these, the nurses on the floor get patients with very, very little documentation, history, all of the above. How does that happen and why does it happen? Okay. So let's break it down. Let's talk about that horrible med list, first of all. <laughs> um, 
you know, we have done this weird thing in our country where we are putting the responsibility on the healthcare provider. You, um, you have to investigate their med list. Me, I have to do it in the ER. If I don't do a good job on it, you're supposed to do it or you're supposed to confirm what I put in there. No one is telling these patients and these family members, hey, you need to keep an updated med list in your wallet. And when your doctor changes it, you need to update it. That is the responsibility of the patient, but no one holds them accountable for that. That's not what our culture says. Our culture says the nurse has to figure it out. <laughs> and I have spent, ah, uh, well, minutes, <laughs> maybe an hour. So imagine that you have a patient who comes in who tells you the pharmacy that they use. You call the pharmacy. The pharmacy is not open because it's 2 a.m., or they get half their meds from this pharmacy and half their meds from mail order. And I don't know what the mail order is, or they say they get their meds from this pharmacy, but you call and they say they haven't had anything filled since 2018. Like it's, you know, you're trying to sleuth it out. And really what happens is uh, it sort of gets dropped on the priorities. Like I'm working on airway breathing and circulation and I'm going to do what I can for this med list. But you know, if it's 2 a.m. And, and, and the CVS is closed or Publix is closed or wherever you use, what am I supposed to do with that information? You know, or like you said, we don't have a good last name for this person. Like <laughs> I can't find a med list if they don't have a last name. I can't even look them up in our system to see if they've been here before. There's a lot of detective work that happens in the ER. Yes. Um, you know, we're trying to find family that we, maybe they can come and tell us some, something, uh, so it, it is, it is quite a challenge. And I know you guys feel it on the floor as well, because when we send them up with a half, you know, a half done one or nothing, because we couldn't, then it turns over to you. Now you're calling pharmacies and you're trying to find family and you're trying to ask the, the questions that we, we couldn't find. Um, the other thing that we do in the ER with documentation is we are doing uh, oftentimes a focused assessment. So when they come in and say that they are having abdominal pain, we're not assessing their toenails. We're not assessing, you know, the bumps for a skin. Yeah. Right. Unless they're a bed bound patient or a, you know, non ambulatory, then we're not, we're not assessing there. So, um, you know, oftentimes we do, we do a focused assessment. Uh, and then again, it has to do with how many patients you're caring for the turnover of those patients. If I'm caring for four or five patients in the ER and they're, you know, and I'm turning them, I'm flipping them. I may end up having cared for 10 or 12 or 15, oh, which is one of the reasons when you call me and say, where's their IV? And you're like, I don't remember. Was that Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Smith that I put it in the right AC, you know, and sometimes we get made fun of because of our reports. When you call, we always say, I just got this patient, right? Like that's super famous or I don't know anything about them. So, but just imagine that you're caring for four patients and now you've got a code or you've got a trauma. It takes three nurses to go run a trauma. So I'm getting pulled away from my assignment to go be in there with that trauma. Now someone else is covering my four patients and their four patients. One of my patients gets a room we're not going to stop that flow. We want that patient to come up to you on the cardiac floor so that I can put the 87 year old in triage with chest pain in that empty bed. Like this is a, this is a priority for me. So I'm going to print out an S bar of my buddy's patient. I'm going to call you and I'm going to say, Q, I'm really sorry. I've been in there one time to help her turn this patient, but I'm going to give you what I can give you because we got to send this patient on. Um, now a vented patient on a bunch of drips, probably not, of but a med not. surge patient patient, that's why we do that. That's why a nurse will say, I've only had this patient for five minutes or, you know, there's a lot of apple cart turnover. Uh, it takes three nurses to run a trauma code. It takes probably two or three nurses to run a STEMI. Uh, certainly a code blue, it's going to pull nurses from areas. And then if it's your patient that they were assigned to that's coming up, now someone's got to call you and give you a report so we can keep the flow moving and keep that waiting room, that hot donuts now sign, you know, keep the flow. <laughs> so yeah. I know it's super frustrating for you guys when we're like, I don't know where the IV is. It's somewhere in their body, you know? Um, and, and I will say on the flip side, one of the things that frustrates us is when we're giving you a report and you're saying things like, um, what's their diet? And we're like, we don't care. <laughs> I don't even know. Or this one is that, what do their lungs sound like? Uh, boo, they don't have a respiratory issue. You're going to listen to it when you do your assessment. Um, unless it's a, you know, 
a lung issue, like you need to find out for yourself. I can tell you what I heard, but like, I can sometimes hear them clicking in the background. Like, are you doing your assessment based on what I'm telling you right now in report before the patient is even rolled? So it, it cuts both ways. Um, but I, I can imagine how frustrating it would be if, if you got a call and, and the nurse was saying, I, I only had him for five minutes. I don't know anything about him, but, uh, you know, they can get up and go to the bathroom and they have IV somewhere in their body. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I respect it. And I really do. I really do. Cause the more you talk about it, 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 it just, it makes sense, right? Like, so if you, if you are a nurse on the floor and you understanding that these ER nurses are taking care of more patients and they have to deal with everything that they, that they have to deal with in the ER, it makes sense. But you bring up a really good point. Uh, Anissa, please. I, I got questions for days. So if you have to go, just let me know. But, um, yeah. um, you bring up such a such a good point because the one time I did shadow a nurse down there, what I was super surprised about was yes, it is chaos. It is like you you look like you if you stand at the door and see what's happening, you would think that it's just like a bo a bomb exploded in there, and it's that every single day, every single time you go down there, right? So I have to talk to you about the communication, and I don't like you. You can talk about it however you want, but there's a certain um. What I love the most is when I was down there, the communication between the um, the nurses and the providers. Because on the floors, it's very much you 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 get the provider when they're there for the um, for their rounds, and that's it. Or you can page them, and that's it. What I loved, I loved when I was down there, and the nurses were so assertive, were so in charge, were so responsible, were so accountable that when they told an MD, an NP, a PA something, those providers acted, I don't want to say immediately, but there was a lot more urgency. And it makes sense because it's the emergency room, but I loved that communication. Um, but obviously that has to also work with your CNAs and the MAs and the transporters and the lab and the CT and the radiology. So the communication is like, I think it has to be like A plus or A for the ER to work well. But tell me what do you, what's the good, the bad, what you struggle with in your specific ER or in general as an ER nurse, what, have, what has worked and what hasn't worked. Yeah, so you made a really, really important observation and it's something that is a treat in the ER that you guys don't have on the floor. And, and sometimes, sometimes they have a provider and intensivist in the ICU, sometimes they don't. But our ER physicians are there 24 hours a day and they are working with us shoulder to shoulder. We don't have to page them. They're right there in the doctor's lounge or somewhere in the department um, all the time, you know, several of them. Uh, so we build, we develop a relationship and a rapport with them that's different than what's going on in other departments. And, uh, you know, we all say that nursing is a team sport and we talk about in the ER, you have to pull together as a team. So this may not be the person that you want to hang out with, you know, on the weekend or that you might want to go to dinner with after your shift, but on shift, you have to be tight. We have to pull together because, you know, we may have a full, full department and then the bus full of prisoners wrecks. And now we got 15 more super acute and we got to make room and we have to pull together and we can't do that thing, you know, at this time. And, and I even like to say on night shift, when there's even less resources, those guys are freaking family. Like you, they're mafia. Like you do not come in between the <laughs> ER night shift. Like they are what they are. Um, and so we do have a little bit of a different relationship with our providers. And once you have established yourself as someone who kind of recognizes what sick is and has some ideas, the providers do work with you and you say, listen, I think I, I really need you to come and see this patient. Like right now I have a bad feeling. They really will. Um, and they will teach you things. You know, you have the opportunity to say, what did I miss? Or what did you see that I didn't see? And, and they will teach you those things. And, and other physicians will do that too. Um, it's just that we have them there with us shoulder to shoulder all the time. Uh, and, you know, the medical director is an important person. The nurse manager is an important person. The charge nurse is an important person. But I'm going to tell you a secret. The person who's running the ER is the freaking unit secretary. Like those, those guys and gals, they are air traffic control in that place. And they are <laughs> keeping things on task and they are moving folks and they are transferring phone calls and they are getting things done. Man. Are uh, they licensed practitioners or are no. they... 
no, thousands, but, just but wow. they, they are honorary. And I, I tell you, like when, when they want to take a 30 minute break to go to lunch and you have to sit at the desk and do what they do and answer the phones and the radios and direct the traffic and do the, you are so ready for them to come back and sit back down. And, and that's when you learn, wow, I, I see who's really running this department. <laughs> it's these guys and oh. girls. I love that. I love that. Um, okay. So, okay, good. Um, before, before we switch over, because I do want to talk about the flight, um, the flight nursing, just because I feel like that's like the apex of ER nursing, because that sounds just insane. And I want to go there, but before we leave the like actual ER unit, right? The floor, just talking about working in an ER, I can feel myself burning out. Right. <laughs> I can, I can. <laughs> yeah. So, it it just it seems like the speed at which everything's happening, the chaos at which like just the whole place is. Uh, I feel like there would be a higher percentage. I don't know the numbers. I haven't done any research. Obviously, I, this is just what I'm thinking about. But is the turnover much higher in ERs? Um, do you guys deal with um, what's it called? Um, burnout. How are you keeping your mental sanity? Uh, with all of that going on and what do you guys do as a team, as a unit, as just nurses to um, alleviate that kind of stress? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I would venture to guess as well that burnout is, it's, it is a high turnover in the ER. Uh, burnout is, is uh, a definitely a significant issue in the ER. Uh, we see, I like to call it the good, the bad, and the ugly. You know, we see miracles, we see really, really bad stuff, and we see some really ugly stuff. And you know, you've seen it on the floor as well, what that ugly is. Uh, and those are the kind of things that will burn you out. And those are the kind of things that um, you have to watch for. So one of the things that we do in the ER, um, when I was sitting in on interviews as the educator, we would interview new hires. Uh, and one of the questions we would always ask is, what do you like to do outside of nursing? Uh, and so people would say, I like to play a musical instrument, or I like to go to church, or I like to walk my dog, or I do yoga, or whatever, fill in the blank. And um, it looks like a little benign, like getting to know you question, but what we're really asking is, do you have a therapeutic coping mechanism that you can turn to when this job gets really, really ugly or really, really bad. We need to know that you have something established in your life that you can turn to when you're having one of those shifts that's bad. Uh, we turn to one another for sure. We do a lot of informal debriefing at the Mexican restaurant after shift, <laughs> like legit and for real, that happens. Um, and I think each individual practitioner has to figure out how to do it on their own. Of course. Um, one of my hacks is I like to make connections with patients. It's one of the things that I feel like we miss out on in the ER that you guys, when you see the same patient and the same family three or four shifts in a row, or sometimes even weeks, you, you're off and you come back and they're still there, you know, and you've developed this rapport with them and, and this love for them. And, you know, um, we have to figure out how to do that quickly, really, really quickly. And we don't get that depth of relationship that you do. Um, but sometimes a little lonely nursing home patient that's hanging out in a hall bed that, you know, needed a G tube replacement or, uh, you know, syncopized, but we can't really find out anything, you know, they're, they're okay. We tuned them up a little bit. They're getting ready to go back. Uh, and you just take a minute to connect with them or you just take a minute to chat them up and, then they think you're the greatest thing ever because you spent a little bit of time with them. You know, uh, kids will do that for me too. Pediatrics will do that for me. Uh, the other thing that refreshes me is preceptees, nursing students, people who are jazzed and excited and on fire again to do the thing that I love. It reminds me, Oh yeah, that's, that's, that's what it's like. That's how great it is. Um, you know, I, I'm only in the ER now, a PRN. So it, it's much easier for me to take a lot of the crap than the people who have to do it, you know, three twelves or more a week. Um, so yeah, that's definitely a real thing that we definitely have to have to figure out and work on for sure. There's a couple of nurses in fact that I want to interview myself because they have been in the department for forever and they must have some kind of secret sauce because right. they are, they're not crusty. They're not jaded. They are still kind and they are still, they still love the, the department. Um, and I want to know what their secret sauce is. I know what I can do for me. 
Um, but, but they, there's, there's some folks out there that have some longevity and, and they must know something. Uh, a lot of new grads will come and go by the third year. I don't know if that's different than ICUs or med surge, but, um, uh, if we can get three to five years out of them, we're pretty happy. Wow. And, and then here's the other thing about that is, you know, let's say you get burned out at year three and you decide to step away and go do something else, you know, whatever that thing is, you can't undo the things that you saw in those three years. You know, those things still happen to you. You still witness them. They were still really ugly. Um, and that's an important thing to point out. You can step away from the profession or step away from the department and not see any of those new things, but you still have those, those patients that kind of touched you or, or, that you will always remember because of how bad it was, those things don't just disappear when you go to a different department. So you have to have a way of, of dealing with it and, um, and reframing it or compartmentalizing it or tucking it away in your heart or, or whatever it is. Uh, wow. I mean, that's, it's heavy. It's heavy. And, and, and I can see exactly what you meant because you're right. There is no answer to those kind of questions, right? Like you don't have an answer. Like, what are you supposed to say? Right? Like, how do you stop someone from becoming jaded? How do you like, how do you build that empathy up again? We don't have those answers. And I can see your frustration or your, you know, just you're, you're, you're wary when you talk about certain aspects of nursing like that. So I really appreciate you at least, you know, giving me what you could give me. And I will say for me, and, I, and you can tell me how it is in your nursing practice, and I'm not sure if this is how everyone feels, but for me, that burnout or that uh, love versus maybe I don't want to do this anymore, it's not linear for me. It doesn't go like this. Oh, yeah. It's like this. You know, it's peaks and valleys. Like, I love my gig. And then six months later, I'm like, oh, my gosh, this flu pneumonia season, It's we're getting hammered with all these sick people, and maybe I don't want to do this. You know, it kind of is a roller coaster. It's not just like this or like this. Yes. You know? no, no, no. Respect. And, and uh, No, you're right. You're right. Uh, and, yeah, that's exactly how it is. Like, some days, some weeks, and you, some months, you're like, I'm a nurse. I work three days a week. I got four days off. I'm living the goddamn dream. And then other times, you're like, I'm done. I'm God damn it. I'm done. Right. So yes, no. So I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. Um, so let's, let's talk about flight nursing. Um, before I let you go here, when did you decide to make that? Like, how did that even become a thing? So I'm guessing that you guys are like a trauma one, because I, I don't know any flight, any hospitals that have flight nurses that, or, or do you work for an agency? Explain how you got into being a flight nurse and why you decided to do that. Because you're right. It's basically an ER and shit can't happen when you're in a helicopter. But like, I don't know. Before I let you, I, it's just, when you think about flight nurses, like I, you watch television and stuff and you, you just see like, they basically glorified transporters is what, <laughs> I mean that in the most respectful way possible. I but take like, it in that way, in the most <laughs> respectful way. Listen, we're just a bunch of dorks in a fancy suit with a super fancy Uber, right? I, I mean- it, we do have a lot of critical skills. We do have a lot of autonomy. That's the big difference is it's me and a medic in the back of the helicopter making decisions about how to care for this patient. We're going to hang something. We're going to tweak a ventilator. We're going to intubate them. Um, those are decisions that we don't have a physician or a nurse practitioner telling us to do. We're making those decisions based on our guidelines. And so we're using our clinical judgment. That's the biggest difference. Um, uh, you how, know, did you, how did you get into it? I, like, I'd like to know like, what would that process was. Yeah, it's a little bit like how I got into nursing. I just sort of float into things and look up and find myself like, how did I get here? <laughs> so I, was, uh, I was the educator in the department. And so that meant that I did all of the helipad training for our nurses when they were going to receive a patient from the flight crew. There's you know, certain things you do on the helipad and certain things you don't for safety and etiquette. Um, and so I would do that training with every, every staff member of the ER. And uh, part of the, the end of my spiel was always, you know, we have one of these companies that offers a third ride experience. If you want to go and do a fly along and just see what it's all about, they invite you to do that. And if you want to do it, I have the number of the guy, I can hook you up, whatever. And I realized several years into it, like, I've never done a third ride. Like, I've, I don't even know what that's about. Like, maybe I should, you know, I'm offering it to all these people. Maybe I should go find out what that is myself, first person. And so I set up a third ride, just like as part of the educator, you know, whatever. Uh, and man, I, I was kind of hooked. I just was hooked. And yes. so uh, it wasn't long after that that I applied. And um, 
well, here we are five years later. So, so I, I, you can only, I, I don't know if you can speak for most flight nursing or like flight nurses, but um, does it work that you're based out of one hospital or do you work in like a town, a city? Like how does, cause I was always like, where is home base for these flight nurses? Like, or are they just everywhere all the time? Right. So there are, there are different programs and they're both of those models that you talked about. There are hospital based programs where the flight crew and the helicopter are based at the hospital and they go out from there to, to go and um, pick up patients. And then there's what's called community based programs where you're actually out in a fairly rural community. Usually um, that's what my program is. So I, my base is at an airport and uh, we're, we have a hangar at the airport and we've got, it's, it kind of works like a fire station. We're there for 24 hours and we have a kitchen and the pilot has a bedroom and the medic has a bedroom and the nurse has a bedroom. We have a little living room and a gym and we hang out. And then when we get a call, we go that's and awesome. um, yeah, and we, <laughs> and that's what we do. Um, and do you guys ever do, cause I, this is just something I see in Grey's Anatomy all the time, but do you guys ever do like, when there's like a, a an organ donation, do you guys ever carry organs? <laughs> That's, I would, that would be super cool. I've never done that. Um, but we do some other really cool things. Like we do evacuations for the hurricanes oh when God. the hurricanes come. Uh, we've got a, I, I'm not a NASCAR fan personally, but we have the, um, the, one of the NASCAR racetracks is right in my backyard. It's actually where, where, uh, one of the places that our aircraft serves. And so we go and, and station there during the NASCAR race. And if there's an accident um, with one of the drivers or whatever, we would take them to the hospital. So uh, that's in addition to just the regular stuff that of we course. do. We, we do have these other opportunities where um, we do some kind of cool stuff, but no, I've never toted a heart. <laughs> okay. So I am, I am, I, I do want to um, end this uh, pretty soon because Nisa, you, you've done just fantastic. And I, I appreciate this uh, a thousand percent, but like, um, I, blast. um so I, I, I did want to know, are there a certain group of people? Like, cause, cause I know a lot of nurses, a, a lot of nurses are like, I can't take care of the elderly because my grandparents, or I can't take care of kids because you know, uh, my kids or labor and delivery, whatever. Right. Are there, uh, um, a population of, uh, of, of people that you have a harder time dealing with, or do you have to just get over that as an ER nurse? And then now it's just whoever comes through the door, I'm good with it. It just takes me a second. Yeah. Uh, so there are some diagnoses that scare me just because I know how bad they can, they can <laughs> go like a, you know, aortic dissection, man, those guys can go bad so quick that I, you know, you have to kind of treat them like a Fabergé egg. Uh, I don't shy away from treating them. I just respect the fact that like, this is a patient that any minute could, could go. Um, I would say if I had to pick a population that is the most challenging for me to care for, it would be the pediatric psychiatric population. So when you have a, a kid who's supposed to be like playing t-ball and student of the week and, you know, believing in Santa Claus or whatever, and they have these really, really intense, horrific psychiatric issues. Um, the resources for psych in general are slim, but pediatric psych, even slimmer. Uh, and it's just so hard to see their family trying to deal with it and trying to tweak the meds and then they grow and then the meds don't work anymore. And um, it's a very, very challenging population. I like taking care of kids. I like taking care of kids a lot. Good for you. But um, sometimes all those tricks that we, you know, that we do, they don't work on a psych kid, you know. Um, it's, so it's a real challenge. I, I you know, I, it's part of ER nursing. You definitely do it. But uh, it's, it's tough. It's really tough. Um, <clears throat> you just keep pulling these questions out of me. But I know you guys must deal with, like, the hypochondriacs, right? But um, I, I forgot what the name of the like uh, the diagnosis of like parents that like to bring their kids into the hospitals and Munchausen. like Munchausen's. Yeah. <clears throat> so I, I don't want to like share. Maybe you have dealt with that, but in the ER, I feel like that's one of the places where you have to like. There's going to be a lot of situations where you need to take things to the ethical board. Is that stuff that you deal with at all? Have you ever dealt with that? And what is that process? Yeah. So you bump into ethical issues a good bit. Um, Usually that's kind of above my pay grade. That's like something I will report to, you know, we, we make reports to Department of Family and Children's Services. We make reports to Adult Protective Services. Um, and then sometimes we do have to report things to the physician and say, look, I, I'm suspicious that, you know, whatever, X, Y, Z, whatever it is. Uh, 
there are ethical issues too, which I know you see this on the med surge floor, and this is one of the ones that's really hard for me is when you have these patients who roll in who are cachexic and trached and pegged and uh, uh, no quality of life whatsoever, and they've got pressure ulcers and they've got Foley catheters in place and just just not how I would ever want to live or want to see one of my family members, but you have a family who's telling you do everything, you know, do everything for them. Uh, that to me is an ethical issue. Uh, but you have to step back and realize, I just want to make it well known that I don't ever want to be in that position. <laughs> this family is making a different choice, you know? Yes. yes. Um, what kind of other ethical things, uh, you know, ER nurses are often the nurses that do sexual assault exams. So when a, when a person comes in and reports that they've been sexually assaulted, we often do the evidence collection and record their story. Uh, that's a really tough one. Wait, for that specifically, is it, and I always wanted to know this, is like being a SANE nurse a certification or is that something you have to go to school for? It is a certification. It's a pretty intense one that you go to a class and then you have to do so many exams uh, uh, with a preceptor and so forth. We ha do now, luckily, we do have in our ER a handful of nurses who are actually SANE certified, but for years we didn't have anyone officially. So it was it was you, you know, yeah. it was me. No, no, no. And, and, that's not, and that's not just you guys. I mean, that's literally every hospital. Right. We right. definitely don't have enough SANE nurses, period. That's not right. just you guys. That's everyone. Right. Um, and so, you know, you, you hear some pretty, pretty horrible things when you, uh, when you're doing those kinds of exams. Um, what other ethical things can I think of? That's okay. Um, cause like, I think you, you've given us more than enough. Um, there's, uh, this is the the last like ER question. And then after that, I do want to talk about you because I think it's heavy. Right. But, um, uh, as an ER nurse, right. Um, you, you are dealing with like just so much all the time. And you saying that you have to have stuff outside of work to take care of yourself, right. To, 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 to something that you can, to help release all of that stuff. And I, I made a Facebook group and it's called nurses are human too, because I think that the, all of us really forget sometimes that it's okay to not be a nurse, right? When you get home and you, you, you take your scrubs off, you don't need to be a nurse that minute, that hour, that's, you're done. Like, you, relax. You can do you for a hot second. You don't have to think about that. I know it's stressful. Did I forget the document? Did I give report right? Did I leave the page? Whatever the situation is, you can relax and you can remember that you are a human and you were a human first before you became a nurse. So Nisa, tell me and the people, what do you do outside of nursing to, to, to feel better about yourself? How, what do you do to like, to let all of that go? That's a good question. Um, so some of the things that I do, I, um, I do like to run. I'm very, very slow, but I take my puppy <laughs> and we do the best we can. Uh, I'm a novice hiker. I feel like getting out into nature where you don't have cell service and you're by yourself. My puppy comes with me for that too. Um, What's his or her name? Gus. Gus. Gus oh, the lab. A, I Gus. love it. You can see him. He's right here by me. Oh, Gus. He's a chunker. Yeah. <laughs> there he is. Hi, Gus. Uh, yeah, he's my buddy. So we... Um, yeah, I was, I was talking about you. Um, so he is, uh, you know, he doesn't care if I've had a good day or bad day. He's going to go wherever I ask him to go. So that's nice. Uh, I do yoga. I will tell you that I'm terrible at the end part of yoga where you're supposed to empty your mind and just be still and be quiet. That's the opposite of what's going on in my mind all the time. Um, there was a yoga studio downtown about three blocks from the ER. And I had to quit going there because I would be doing yoga and I would hear sirens go by and I would be like, oh, are we understaffed? Is everybody ready? I wonder what that is. Is that a trauma? I wonder what it is. And I was like, okay, I can't get on my Zen here. I got to go across town to a different yoga studio. Um, a, a million people have told me, not necessarily nurses, but a lot of people have told me about the benefits of meditation. And I am the worst failed meditator uh, in recording like recorded history. I've tried and tried and tried and I just can't do it. I just can't empty my mind. And what I have found is that ER nurses use, don't laugh when I say this, this is real life. Uh, we use gangster rap and eighties hair metal and punk rock. And this is our meditation. Like sometimes blasting those loud, obnoxious things at 10 does help you to empty your mind. It's the way that we do it. 
Um, I asked our listeners to send me like, what's your pump up song that you listen to on the way to work to get you like in the headspace for a shift. And they sent me the most explicit <laughs> rap and metal and punk and all of it. And I was just like, you guys are some crazy, <laughs> I can't publish this. Like what the heck? Um, but, but there's something to that. There, there is something about turning it up loud to 10 to empty your mind and get you in that space. But it's a different kind than that quiet, still <clears throat> meditation type. Um, so I call it ER meditation by gangster rap. Um, what else do I do? So another very significant thing in my life is I am spiritual. I am a spiritual person. And so a lot of times I, it, I, it sounds cliche and, and cheesy, but I do feel like nursing is a calling and that, you know, taking care of people is, uh, is a way to serve humanity. And so I, you know, I pray and I, um, try to keep a perspective that maybe this life is not all there is to it. And so sometimes that helps me get through some of the bad stuff, a death, uh, a death of somebody who, whose time it wasn't yet. Uh, so I do rely on that quite a bit. Um, and what else? And then, you know, honestly, the podcast, the podcast where we get together and talk about all the things that ER nurses are feeling. I mean, we do some, some clinical stuff, but mostly it's about navigating the culture of the ER. And I love, love, love it when people tell me, I thought I was the only one that felt this way. And then I heard your episode on X, Y, or Z. And I realized that I'm not the weirdo, that this is a normal thing that we think or feel. Um, so that's a huge outlet for me. I love it. I love all of those things because yes, sometimes you need to turn it up to 10. Sometimes you need to go to the church, the mosque, the temple. Sometimes you need to go on a hike. Sometimes you just need your dog to cuddle up next to you. Exactly. You need it. You need it all. And, and then that's why I started that Facebook group just because it's so easy to just give 110% of yourself 24 seven to the hospital, to, to your unit, to the ER, to whatever the situation is. You can forget really easy that you need to take care of yourself because the best, the self care is the best kind of care. Cause if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of nobody else. So, um, uh, Nisa, Talk to me about what this podcast is, right? So please explain. I know you, you just gave a real brief, but I want you to give me a real answer. What is the Q Word podcast? What's it about? What are you doing and why did you do it? Okay. Um, so the Q Word refers to that one word that we don't say when we're having a nice shift that sometimes a, a newbie will say or someone who's not superstitious will say just to get people like me who are superstitious <laughs> riled up. So we don't say that word. Uh, we chose that title. I say we because I have a co-host. My best friend is my co-host. We chose the title because we want it to sort of be an inside joke for uh, healthcare providers. So the Q word is not um, specific to ER or to just nurses. Medics believe it. Uh, firefighters believe it. ICU nurses, med searcher, everybody knows what that what that's about. But that's just in healthcare. So it's kind of our little, uh, little superstition. Um, and I started the podcast because I was listening to a lot of really good podcasts that I loved and I was learning a lot from that were EMS podcasts uh, by medics or ER physician podcasts. So when they were talking about whatever the topic was or whatever the, the clinical thing was, they were talking about it from the perspective of a medic or a physician. And I would always translate it to, well, for the ER nurse, what that would mean is blah, blah, blah. And then um, I realized I kept doing that. And I thought, you know what? I want to go and find the podcast that is from the ER nurse's perspective. Like, I want to listen to that podcast. And so I went looking for it, and I couldn't find it. Um, I didn't find it out there. So I went back to my medic podcast and back to my ER physician podcast for a little while longer. And then I was like, well, you know what? I think I'm just going to do it myself. Yes. You know, there's probably other ER nurses that want to yes. hear this through the lens of an ER nurse. Um, I'm by no means an expert. I, um, but it, I do love nursing. And so it's not a problem for me on my downtime to research something or dig into something or interview someone, uh, and talk about ER nursing. It is a way I think of coping with burnout and keeping that, that passion, you know, that fire flamed a little bit. So we, like I said, we do a little bit of clinical stuff here or there. Um, but mostly it's things like, uh, like we have an episode on the dark humor of nurses. Yes. Um, we have an episode about how we hate it when people ask us, what's the worst thing you've ever seen? Um, and, and some of the potential answers that you could give. 
Um, we have episodes on the EMS ER nursing continuum. You know, we receive patients from them and how, how to facilitate that. Um, so yeah, um, it, it's super fun. I love that you said that because so I, I don't do any research and I like to just go with the flow with these interview, right? But like I always look up stuff. Like I just go to like Google and just type in ER nurses and see what the first thing that pops up. And I swear to God, that's literally the first 10 links is like worst thing you've seen in the ER. I'm like, I hate it with a passion when people ask me that. What do you want me to tell you? You want me to tell you one of my favorite patients died and I was crying in the break room for six hours? Like, what, I hate when people ask me that question. So I'm really happy that you have an entire episode dedicated to that because when people ask you that question, they, they want something funny. Like I pulled this out of someone's bum, but like that's... Right. That's that's not the worst. That's, that's not what comes to mind for you. That's exactly. exactly. So that's so I love yeah, and that's why I did not ask that question because I hate when that question is asked of Thank me. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for not asking that. So um, this is it. This is it. Thank you, Nisa. You've been absolutely amazing. But before I go, I call you an everyday hero, Nisa, right? So because you're an everyday hero. Thank course, you. Of course. Yeah. That's it. That's it. But um, you're an everyday hero. But I last thing advice. Give advice to um, ER nurses right now or nurses that want to become an ER nurse. Um, what advice do you have? And I, I'm just going to leave it at that because I want you to take it wherever you want to take it. Advice to ER nurses or nurses that want to become ER nurses. Wow. Oh, so many pieces of advice. Um, don't waste your money on cheap black pens. Uh, an empty bladder is a happy bladder. You got, if you get a chance to pee, you better pee. If you get a chance to eat, you better eat. Yes. Um, and then on a more serious note, the piece of advice that I give out with a little bit of caution is, uh, I like to say, and I was taught this by one of my mentors and I pass it along that, um, task oriented nursing kills patients. Um, and when you roll that around in your head for a while, what you realize is a lot of what we do in nursing is task oriented. We got to get the home meds in, we got to get in line and we got to get the labs and we got to put in the assessment about their spiritual needs and whether they're left-handed or right-handed and what pharmacy they use and task, 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 task. Meanwhile, is your patient decompensating right in front of you and you're missing that? And so, um, yeah, those things are super important a really good nurse of any kind, ER, med surge, ICU, whatever, uh, can do both of those things or balance both of those things. So as I'm putting you on the monitor, as I'm starting your IV, I'm assessing your skin, I'm feeling your temperature, I'm looking at your breathing, I'm doing it all simultaneously. Um, in the ER, it's, a, it's about assess, reassess, reassess, take a second look, take a third look. Um, so that's the advice that I give out with caution. I don't often give that to new grads because new grads need to have those task lists, you know, they don't know how to mer merge those yet. Um, but eventually that's what I would say is pay attention to your patient, reassess your patient, um, and, you know, and, and get the task done in the meantime. So that, 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 Nisa, that's a golden piece of advice. Listen, I, it was Janet Findlay in the CVICU that gave it to me and I have just latched onto it and passed it along with her name. That, that then. is shout out to Janet. Cause I mean, like, right. like, once you say it, it hits you. You're like, holy shit. Like, the majority of my day, I'm just looking at the task list, trying to, like, just finish up the documentation that I need to so I can go home on time. But you're right. I mean, that's, we're not, we're not, we, we don't go to the hospital. We aren't nurses. We don't have the badge because we have to finish a list on a computer on Epic. We're, we're, we're nurses so we can take care of the, the person in the bed. Um, that's little... I, I, I love that. It's a I, I did, this is episode eight, uh, 81 of the Everyday Hero Show. Wow. It's the first time I've gotten that piece of advice. And God damn it, I love it. Easily top <laughs> five. Nisa, easily top yeah. five. Right. Tell Janice I give her a shout out because that's fantastic. Fantastic. Um, I'm not saying the tasks aren't important. For sure they are. Of course. But, uh, but yeah. Um, uh, plug away, please. Where can people find you? Just everywhere, 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 everywhere. Please plug away. Let them know. Yeah, so we're on uh, all of the social media. You can find us at thekewordpodcast.com. We're on Insta, we're on Twitter, we're on Facebook. Uh, you can find me at all those places too. Personally, I'm happy to you know chat with you about um, how you disagree with me, how you hate the documentation <laughs> we do, how bad our med lists suck, <laughs> uh, or <laughs> how uh, if you want to try flight nursing or you're thinking about making the switch to ER or... Um, 
whatever I, I would love to, to interact. So, um, all the social media and then our, our website is the keywordpodcast.com. And then the podcast itself can be found on, um, iTunes, Google play. You can say, Hey Alexa, play it, Google, Hey Google, play it. Um, and we'll come up. We're on Pandora and, um, Stitcher and all, all those places. All those places. Find us. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, it is E R E D Nurses Week. If you if Woo! if there's if there's ever a week, a time to go look them up, to go check them out, this is the week. This is the time. You better, you better. The links are all gonna be in the description box below. You better go click them, go check Nisa out. Nisa and oh, I'm sorry, I forgot your partner's name. Lisa. Lisa, <laughs> it's, it's are you serious? Ride. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's my she was my college roommate, my best friend for 30 years, and our names happened to rhyme. So I love it. Nisa and Lisa, go check them out the Q Word podcast. I absolutely love it. I couldn't have asked for a better E D E R nurse to come on the show for this week. Um, this is gonna come out on Sunday. So you guys go check them out, go check them out, go check them out. Nisa, thank you so, so, so much. Thank you, Q. I had so much fun. Of course.